common questions that we get as members of the church um, often center around tithing or tithes and offerings. Um, and I wanted to address a couple of those questions today that I thought might be helpful, and maybe I can point you to some resources that will be helpful in understanding this divine principle a little bit better. Okay, So one of the questions that we get uh, has to do with uh, this, this misunderstanding that why must we pay money to get to the highest part of heaven? Right? Why must we pay money? Okay, so let's take a look at some things. Okay. Um, this is under the LDS.org or ChurchJesusChrist.org tithing section. And it talks about tithing um, and kind of helps us understand that it's, it's not about the money. Uh, it's not that God needs our money in that sense or that we're somehow buying our way into heaven uh, as if that's somehow dependent on wealth. Uh, but here's a line that I thought was helpful. It says, One of the blessings of membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the privilege of paying tithing. Okay? Now, you might not think of it as a privilege if you're equating it to something like taxes or bills, um, but that's not what tithing is. Okay? It says, This privilege is a double blessing. By paying tithing, church members, one, show their gratitude to God for their blessings and their resolve to trust in the Lord rather than in material things. A uh, way I've heard it said before is, is that, um, by paying your tithing, you're, you're indicating to the Lord that you're confident that he can help you do more with 90% of your, your income than you could do with 100. Okay, that you're like, you're basically turning that 10% over to him as a show of trust and gratitude. Okay, and then lastly, it says they also help further the work of the Lord in the earth. Okay, um, and we know that tithing funds are used for all sorts of really uh, necessary and noble purposes, such as um, building churches, building temples, um, helping to maintain all of these structures, run the programs of the church related to um, young men's and young women's um, and relief societies, so the, the, the adult sisters, um, the elders quorum. Uh, it, it helps with all of the expenses associated with running the church. It also helps with the missionary program and other things like that to help spread the gospel throughout the earth. Now, in addition to tithing, there's also fast offerings, which give us an opportunity to bless our fellow men and women um, who are in need uh, of, of assistance financially, um, who, are, who helps to support um, them when they, when they need food, uh, when uh, economic downturns happen, um, the bishops or the local leaders of the congregations are able to use those fast offering funds to help support uh, these people in need and help get them back on their feet. Okay, um, So understanding what the tithes and um, offerings are used for can help us maybe to see that this really isn't about the money, because if it was just about the money— then it, there would be a specific amount, like pay this amount and you're good. But instead, the Lord asks us to give 10% of whatever we have, okay? And an example of this is if we go to um, Luke chapter 21, the Savior is uh, in Jerusalem and in, in the temple, and he sees the rich men in verse 1 casting their gifts into the treasury, and he also saw a certain poor widow casting in Thither two mites, right? We know the widow's mite. We know the story. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. In other words, more than the, the rich men. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her pen, penury hath cast in all the living that she had. In other words, um, the Lord isn't so concerned that her 10% or, or what she's giving is a small amount. What he wants is her heart. And tithing is a way to demonstrate to the Lord that I care more about you than I do about this money, okay? Um, and it's a 10% for all of his children, right? For all, whether you make a lot of money or a little money, it's 10%. And it gives all of us an opportunity to demonstrate to the Lord that he is our priority and that we are grateful for what he's given us and we want to help him to continue to bless other people um, through, his, through his church. Okay, now if you're looking for some examples, um, from the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, Abraham pays tithings to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. All the way to the very end of the Old Testament, we see in Malachi, the Lord, in Malachi chapter 3, um, says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Okay, so from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, we have examples of well as well of the Lord 
expecting some form of tithing. Um, because, again, I'm convinced he knows what it can do for us. He doesn't need our money. He is the creator of all things, right? Like if he needs money, he can just he can just direct the, the leader of the church to go find the nearest gold deposit that nobody knows about. But that's not the, that's not the point. It's not about the money. It's about our hearts and what uh, turning our hearts and, and as part of that, our uh, worldly treasures and our priorities over to him can do for us. Okay. It also opens the gateway for him to bless us even more. Okay. Um, in Doctrine and Covenants, let me see if I can find the right one here. In uh, my mistake, it's actually in Malachi, in Malachi 3 that we were just looking at. The Lord says that if you will bring your tithes into the storehouse, um, that he will open us the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In other words, he's saying, I want to bless you. I want to open the windows of heaven and pour down blessings upon you. And this is one of the ways that you can, in other words, open those windows, right? If you will just be faithful and obedient to this commandment, okay? Now, uh, you might be asking, well, where did we get this percentage amount, right? Why don't we just give whatever we want or whatever we feel is the right amount, okay? Um, The the tithes and and how tithing and consecration have been implemented over time has varied. Um, It has been applied and taught in different ways over time based on the circumstances and needs of his children through his prophets. Um, But in our day, um, we've received revelation through a modern prophet, in this case, Joseph Smith, in Doctrine and Covenant section 119, explaining tithing and how it is to be done in his era and up till our, t- our day as well. It says, This shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. And after that, those who have been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually. Okay, one-tenth, so 10%. So if you wonder, where did that amount come from? It came from the Lord through a prophet. Um, And if you're struggling with this concept of like a specific amount, might I encourage you to um, seek out and and strive to strengthen and ask the Lord for a stronger testimony of living prophets. Um, Because as you strengthen your testimony that the Lord still, as in ancient times, calls and directs living prophets to help guide and direct his people, um, then when you see something like this that has a specific requirement, that you know has come from a prophet, then you can say, well, I believe in living prophets, therefore I can follow this counsel. Uh, it's also my testimony that as the Lord taught in the book of John, that if any man will do his will, then he'll know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself, or in other words, whether like a man is speaking of himself. And, and he's, so if we will obey, then the Lord can confirm truth. Now, if we just wait around and say, I'm not going to obey, I'm not going to follow the commandment until I'm positive that it's from God, well, we're kind of setting ourselves back. The Lord doesn't say, um, I'll show, like we sometimes say to the Lord, show me and then I'll believe, whereas the Lord does it the other way around. He says, believe and then I'll show you. Exercise faith, act in faith, and then I can confirm the truth of it unto you, okay? Which is a little hard for us sometimes, but that's where the faith comes in, taking a step without a perfect knowledge, okay? But trusting in him and trusting that he speaks through his prophets, okay? Um, Something else to keep in mind. uh, Sometimes people say, I don't feel like it is very God-like or it's not like God to demand a certain amount, okay? Um, (laughs) And I can understand where you're coming from with that. Uh, I I would still encourage to to strengthen testimonies of prophets, um, but in fact, the God, God is asking a lot more than 10%. Um, he's asking for everything. He wants us, all of us. Um, we believe in this principle called consecration that was practiced both in the ancient church and today. Uh, and basically what consecration means is to dedicate something to a sacred purpose. Okay, Church members in all ages have consecrated talents, times, and resources to establish and build the kingdom of God on the earth. And in fact, in our temples... Um, As adults, when we go and make certain covenants, when we receive our endowment uh, in the temple, we are asked to make a covenant to consecrate our talents, times, and resources to God. In fact, everything that we have. Now, why would God ask us to give everything? Because he knows that's what it takes. He knows that unless we're willing to give everything to him, 
and turn even our lives and our hearts over to him, then we won't have made the sacrifice necessary um, to become like him. Okay, We have to be willing to give it all. And, and in nowhere is there a better example than our Savior Jesus Christ. Right, uh, He is the best example of consecration. He gave it all. He gave his life. And in the Garden of Gethsemane on the cross, he gave everything that he had because that's what the Lord required. And we know that by virtue of his goodness, his obedience, his submissiveness to the will of the Lord and his consecration, that he was able to make a way for all of us to return to our Father in heaven through his atonement. Uh, Consecration is powerful, not only because of what it does for those who are blessed by our consecrated efforts, but because of what it does to us and how it changes us and helps us to become consecrated Christ-like people. Okay. Now, um, maybe one last question or comment um, about tithing. Sometimes people get a little bit confused with regards to the example of the Savior in the temple, okay, where there's the money changers in the temple, um, and they're they're basically desecrating that part of the temple with their uh, greedy activities, and they 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 associate that with tithing and and think, well, tithe, money should just have nothing to do with the church, right? And and we shouldn't do any of that. Um, a big difference between that kind of an example and the Lord's law of tithing and consecration, as we see it today is where their hearts were at and and <laughs> why they were doing it. Okay, in the temple, yes, they did need to have animals to uh, sacrifice on the altars as temple rituals were performed then. But they didn't need to uh, be performing that money-changing act and the sale of animals in the temple courtyards, right? That is a sacred space. That's not what that was for, okay? Moreover, a lot of greedy and selfish and cheating acts were likely perpetrated in those uh, exchanges. Um, And these were all being done on temple grounds. And so understandably, the Savior says, make not my father's house a den of thieves. He knew what was going on there, right? He, he, He doesn't... Their issue there is that they were trying to satisfy their own greed. The purpose of tithing and consecration is the exact opposite. It's selflessness. It's charity for our fellow men. It's love and gratitude toward God. Okay, so that's a very different example. I can see how people sometimes associate that with tithing. That's not the case here. Now, kind of returning to our original question about why must we pay money to get to the highest part of heaven? Um, To receive the highest degree of the celestial glory and be exalted and become like our heavenly parents. We need to do as they've done and we need to become like them. Tithing and consecration are principles designed to help us become like them. It's not, I need to pay a certain amount by the time that I die in order to get into heaven. It's that the act of paying tithing, the act of consecrating our time, talents, and everything with which the Lord has blessed us to his kingdom, it's in doing that, that we become and develop those attributes of godliness. Now, that's probably not going to happen in this life. We're not going to get there all the way in this life. But commandments like tithing and consecration open the windows of heaven and allow God to bless us. They, they help change our hearts in this life, and they help us to become more like him. I am so grateful for the law of tithing and the, the principle of consecration, and that we have the opportunity and the privilege to participate in them. Uh, it's been my experience that as I faithfully tried to live these commandments, that the Lord has always taken care of me. Um, and even if you struggle and say, well, I haven't always been in the financial best shape even though I paid tithing, keep in mind the eternal perspective and what God is trying to do. He's trying to mold your heart first and foremost. And if you're paying tithing and consecrating your time and talents to him, then regardless of your financial situation, know that your heart is in a better place um, and that you are coming closer to your heavenly father. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.